Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution and you should have a guided notes sheet um, called the Industrial Revolution that you can fill in as you follow along. Um, the Industrial Revolution transitioned from human and animal power to machines and new technology. The Agricultural Revolution was the use of new technology and machines on the farms. Greatly increased food supply and uh, medical advances led to a huge population increase. The steam engine built by James Watt in the 1770s uh, provided power for the textile or clothing and coal mining industries, also for farm and transportation machines. The steel industry in the 1850s, Harry Bessemer of the steel industry, developed the Bessemer process, creating strong, inexpensive steel. Coal and steel industries provided tremendous power, but required mining operations and caused pollution. Because of its business-oriented culture and government, Great Britain took the lead in industrialization and soon spread to Western Europe and the U.S. in the early 1800s. By the late 1800s, industrialized nations dominated non-industrialized nations throughout the world. So why did industrialization begin in England, begin in England first? I'm going to segue away from the guided notes for a moment to talk about a few of these slides and then we will go back to the guided notes. So there's a continental movement um, and the British Agricultural Revolution. These two things are going to increase food production and they're gonna make food production more efficient, less, less labor intensive, and they're gonna encourage a surplus of food. Basically, there's going to be more food available. People are going to be able to eat better which is going to make them healthier, so they're going to live longer, they're going to be able to have more children, more of those children are going to reach adulthood, the population is going to increase. Um, because the surplus population couldn't find agricultural employment, um, that, or cottage industry employment, that's where you would make the items in your home, um, they started, these, these uh, jobs started moving to factories. Um, colonial expansion uh, in the 17th century uh, developed international trade. There were more markets to sell these goods, so more of these goods needed to be produced. Um, and more capital uh, could be acquired, which could increase profit. So the agricultural revolution, we see the horse and, and steel plow being developed. We see fertilizer being used. They learn how to use fertilizer to replenish the nutrients in the soil, which is going to improve their yields by 300% from 1700 to 1850. That is a huge amount of increase. Um, foreign trade for manufactured goods is also going to increase. Um, there's going to be a lot more foreign colonies that can't get finished products where they're at. They have to be shipped in from the mother countries. Um, ships are going to get bigger, um, and there's going to be more of them. And then successful wars and foreign conquests are going to provide more resources for investment. All of this is happening in Britain. Britain is being very successful in these things. Then you're going to have the Enclosure Act, where Britain is going to actually, instead of having open lands where everybody can pasture their animals um, here, they're going to put up fences and enclose these lands. And these enclosures are going to um, make it more difficult for people to farm um, as a regular living. Um, so why in England? Well, England had no civil strife. They, it was a relatively peaceful time in England. They favored trade. They favored a laissez-faire economy where the government left industry alone. They had a large middle class. They were an island. The geography of it being an island kind of isolated them to a lot of the things that were going on on the continent of Europe. Their population was mobile. They, they were going to establish new colonies and moving around to different places within England. Um, Everyone who lived in England was within 20 miles of a navigable river. 
So it was not hard to get your goods to the main mode of transportation at the time, which was water. Um, they had a tradition of experimental science. They had experimented for a long time and, and they, um, they, they liked doing that. It was accepted. And they had weak guilds. The guilds had not become as strong in England as they had in other uh, nations. And so they were, people were able to break away from that. The Industrial Revolution is a major shift to technological, socioeconomic, and cultural conditions in the late 18th and 19th century. It begins in Britain and spreads throughout the world. The Watt steam engine in Madrid, that, that's what this picture is. This is the Watt steam engine. Now, it was not a small thing. Uh, but the development of the steam engine propels the Industrial Revolution in Britain. It's created to pump water from coal mines, enabling them to deepen beyond groundwater levels so that mines could go deeper. What was happening was people could dig at, into the mine for coal until they hit the groundwater, and then they couldn't go any farther even though there was still more coal down there. The steam engine is able to pump that water out, allowing them to go deeper and deeper. The effect spread throughout Europe and North America, South America, um, and eventually throughout the world. During this time, manual labor was the dominant um, way of method of production, but uh, machinery is going to come in. The innovation of machinery is going to change that. Um, so let's talk about some of the new inventions of the Industrial Revolution. These are not, some of these will be in the guided notes, but this is still not part of the guided notes. I will tell you when I go back to that. The spinning jenny is frequently pointed to as the first major technological in invention in the Industrial Revolution. Um, the invention that really drives the Industrial Revolution, however, is the steam engine. The cotton industry continues to grow. The steel industry grows by leaps and bounds. And a lot of this is because England sits on a massive amount of coal. So the coal could be used to power the steam engine. The steam engine could be used to power the factories. So Watt invents the machine in 1763. His name is James Watt. He invents the machine in 1763. It's patented in 1769. Um, and it can be applied to all kinds of different industries. He's not a really good businessman though. So he teams up with a businessman named Matthew Bolton. Um, and that is how the steam engine really begins to change the face of English manufacture. By 1800, Watt and Bolton have sold 289 of their steam engines. By the middle of the century, the steam engine has replaced water as the major source of power in England and Europe. So it's a huge, huge invention. Some other inventions that are of note are the cotton gin. The cotton gin picks the seeds out of the cotton. Um, and, and it makes it a whole lot faster. Cotton was actually not a very good cash crop before the cotton gin was invented because it would take uh, one person all day long to pick the seeds out of just one little bushel of cotton. The cotton gin increases that exponentially. Then you have the flying shuttle. Uh, this is, these are just some of the inventions. Uh, this is going to help uh, revolutionize the weaving process. Um, you have the water frame, the power loom. All of these are dealing with textiles, and textiles were one of the biggest industries in England. So it's another reason that England was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You have the steam tractor, the steam ship. This is going to be a huge, um, uh, huge invention for transportation because now you can go not only downstream, not only with the current of the water, but you can go against the current of the water, massively shortening travel times. Uh, this is an early steam locomotive. It's going to come a little bit later. Kind of looks like Thomas the tank engine. All right, coal. Coal is king. England is sitting on massive amounts of coal. Coal can be burned. England doesn't have a whole lot of trees left. Um, because they used all those to build up their shipbuilding um, a couple centuries ago. And, you know, and so coal is what they have to burn, but they sit, they're sitting on massive amounts of it. Um, and, it's, and it's cheaper. 
so they could substitute it for wood and it would burn hotter and it would melt iron and steel, allowing them to make more products out of it. Uh, this is a map that is showing you the coal producing areas in yellow. Uh, orange is where the metal goods were produced and purple is where the cloth wool would be uh, would be produced. Um, canals connected all these different uh, rivers, navigable rivers, which made the transportation of the finished goods or of the raw materials uh, much quicker, which is going to uh, continue to help England develop in the Industrial Revolution. And then once the, in, once the railroad is developed, um, it's definitely going to reduce travel times and shipping times. Uh, you had had the stagecoach, and to get from London to uh, Edinburgh, it would take you uh, 43 hours, almost two whole days on a stagecoach. And that's going to be a really rough, bumpy ride. Um, once the, uh, the railroad comes about, it's only going to take you 12 hours and 15 minutes. Um, it's going to significantly reduce the time. Six hours to Brighton goes down to one hour and 15 minutes. So you can see that that is going to be a major um, uh, advantage as well. Um, again, this is a map showing you textiles, coal fields, railroads. In 1800, one ton of coal was being mined and it took 50,000 miners to do it. By 1914, um, 250 million tons of coal uh, were being mined. That's down 50 million tons from 1880, um, but you have 1,200,000 miners. So you can see just in 114 years how massively the coal industry grows. And it's because it is really um, uh, driving, it's, it's really the driving force behind the Industrial Revolution. All right, so factory production works differently than cottage industry. Factory production concentrates production in one place, puts all the materials and labor in one place. The cottage industry, you and your family might make one thing. You might spin the wool into yarn. Um, and then somebody else would take that and, and weave it. Um, so the factory puts all the materials and labor in one place. Um, it's usually located near sources of power um, rather than labor or markets. So you didn't have to go to a town or a village. Your factory would be um, near a coal mine or near a water source, somewhere that, where you could get power. Um, and because transportation was so much better, uh, now you didn't have to be right where the market was. You, you had the ability to get the product from the factory to the market. It did require a lot of capital investment. The machines, the factory building itself were not cheap. Um, it took uh, a little bit more skilled labor um, in the beginning. Um, and only 10% of Eng English industry in 1850 was in the factories. But it certainly was a more um, efficient means of producing a finished product. Again, you see a chart here that shows you in 1813, there were 2,400 looms, 150,000 textile workers. By 1815, there's 224,000 looms with over a million uh, textile workers. The factory system did have a rigid schedule. You worked a 12 to 14 hour day. There were dangerous conditions. It was mind numbing monotony. You had one job and you had, that was all you did all day long, but you became very quick and efficient at that job. It was, there were poor working conditions. Children supplied a lot of the labor because they didn't have to be paid as much. So it was cheaper to employ children. Um, you had the Ludites who were handy craftsmen. Um, they were actually replaced by the machines. Um, you no longer needed somebody to physically do the work with their hands. You had a machine that did a lot of it. Um, and the Ludites actually tried to organize to stop industrialization uh, because it was costing them their jobs. There was the problem of pollution. Um, this burning of the coal was, was causing a lot of waste product and a lot of, a lot of pollution. Um, that was a cartoon. Um, that, that depicted that. You also had overpopulation because 
um, factories tended to be located near, in near cities or cities grew up around the factory. Um, and so more and more people were leaving agriculture uh, because you didn't need as many people to work agriculture anymore. They were leaving agriculture, they needed jobs, they went to the cities to get jobs in the factory. Um, you needed a lot of workers in a factory, so uh, you had a lot of people living in one place. Um, and the cities and towns tended to become overpopulated. They were dirty, uh, they were bad uh, sanitary conditions, um, disease spread like wildfire. These are. Uh, this is a picture, and I'm not sure how well you can see it, um, on your uh, on the video but if you'll pull this PowerPoint up this is the one that I sent you through email if you pull it up you'll be able to see that each one of these is kind of the back yard to each one of these little homes um, so they're just crammed right up upon each other these are factory workers at home and they don't have furniture they're trying to do their daily work of mending and sewing and after they've worked a 12 to 14 hour day um, at the factory these are coal miners. Uh, these are children. Uh, a lot of times they work 12 to 16 hours a day. They didn't have enough pay to, to, for the survival of the family. So the women and children would work as well. Um, the men, women and children got paid less. Um, and so they, they, a lot of times employers wanted to give them jobs more so than the men. The children were exploited to get into the smallest places and many of them got sick and died. The mortality rate was really high. This is a picture that shows you how the kind of work the children would do. They'd be in this position all day long, pulling or pushing the carts full of um, coal up out of the mine. Um, <clears throat> this is the Crystal Palace in 1851. It was an exhibition showing all the things that industry could do, all the technological advancements at the time. This is the interior of it. Um, these are some of the machines that you would have seen in the factories being displayed. So it's trying to get people on board with the Industrial Revolution and show them the awe, the awe of, of all of these inventions and technology. The American Pavilion, which is uh, showing um, American inventions. Okay, what kind of life does this bring? Well. You have the bourgeoisie, or the industrial nouveau riche. What that means is you have a class of citizens who now can imitate the rich. They have enough disposable income that they can buy products that are being made by this industrial revolution. And they want to look like the rich. They may not be able to afford the same quality of the rich, but they can mimic it. And so um, they start buying fashions that are similar to what the rich would wear. Um, and this is a criticism of, of uh, a, a political cartoon that criticizes them. This is the stereotype of a factory owner. Right? If, you can, if you look on the PowerPoint on your own computer, you see that these are supposed to be like slave drivers with whips and these uh, factory workers have uh, chains around their neck like slaves. And, and it's showing the factory workers nothing but a, a slave driver. Um, upstairs and downstairs life. The, the uh, bourgeoisie uh, and the nobles lived upstairs in some sort of luxury while the staff lived downstairs um, in squalor. Um, and, and it was the, the difference that was uh, being portrayed there. Um, to give you an idea, the a average age of the workers and what how much they would make in uh, 1830, if you, if, if you were a child under 11 and you were a boy, you would make two shillings three a day. Uh, girls would actually make two shillings four a day. So at this point, little girls made more than little boys. But, um, and that continues when you're 11 to 16. Um, but that changes when you hit 17. 17 to 21, uh, boys make more than girls. And that's going to continue through the rest of their lives. Your prime uh, age for earning an income is between 22 and 46. 22, age 22 and 46. That's when you're going to earn the best income. Um, really up until age 36, and then after 36, it's going to start to decline. 
Um, once you hit around 47, you're going to see a significant drop off in income. Um, and by the time you get to 57, uh, it's going to be a, a major decrease in income. Um, this is going to cause a lot of poor people. So you're going to have a lot of rich people. There's going to be some middle class. Um, but you're going to have a lot of poor people too. And this is where some of the private charities are going to come, uh, going to open up and you're going to have things like soup kitchens. Um, all right, we'll get to the protest and reformers in a moment. I want to come back to the guided notes. Roman numeral two starts with inventors and it's inventors and entrepreneurs developed modern industry. Electric power, people learn to use electricity. Michael Faraday built the first generator in 1831. Thomas Edison invented many devices, including the light bulb, in 1879. And Nikolai Tesla pioneered electric power plants and components in the 1880s, which made mass distribution of electric power possible. Advances in communications sped improvements. In 1837, Samuel Morse invented the telegraph and sent a message through electric impulses. Alexander Graham Bell built the telephone in 1876. Marconi, so it's uh, Guglielmo Marconi, built the radio in 1895. Then you have transportation advances, which include the construction of roads, canals, and the railroad and it increased economic activity and industrial power. George Stevenson improved the train and developed Britain's first railroad in 1825, long before the U.S. gets uh, railroad transportation as a norm. The late 1800s development of the internal combustion engine led to the automobile and oil industries, and Orville and Wilbur Wright invented the airplane in 1903. New methods of production came about with Eli Whitney developed interchangeable parts. Now, I talked to you about the cotton gin. That was something that Eli Whitney came up with. But the most um, important invention that he came up with during this time was interchangeable parts. No longer did you have to go to the blacksmith and have a part specifically made for your machine or for what you needed. You could go and buy a part from the store um, or order it from a factory. Early 1900s, automaker Henry Ford made efficiency improvements to the factory system with the assembly line. Business industrialization is when huge businesses with many investors called corporations developed. Some totally dominated an industry leading to a monopoly. All right, Roman numeral three, the effects of rapid industrialization in the early to mid 1800s. You have urban explosion. Because of farm machines and population increase, millions move to the cities. It's called urbanization. Large cities suffer from inadequate sewage systems, crowded and unsafe housing, pollution, labor unrest, and epidemics of crime and disease. They were not great places to live. Working conditions. This is B under Roman numeral three. Working conditions. Often whole families were first forced to work 12 to 16 hour days for low wages. Factories were very unsafe. The Industrial Revolution led to systems of modern economies. So it led to uh, three different types of modern economies. Uh, so this is letter C under Roman numeral three, number one. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. It explained modern capitalism, where the means of production and property are owned and run by private citizens and not the government. Capitalism is based on a laissez-faire government philosophy. Let the economy run itself. Competition and profit are also parts of the capitalist um, economy, as well as ideas, uh, as well as um, Ideas, and this was embraced by the U.S. and Western Europe. Number two, by mid 1800s, socialism had developed, and that said that government should control the economy and redistribute the wealth through social welfare programs embraced by the working poor. 
Karl Marx believed that poor workers needed a violent revolution to gain control of the economy and the means of production. He wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848 and described communism, which is where workers collectively all own property, sorry, workers collectively own all property and means of production and share equally all resources in a society without social classes, ideas, these were ideas that were largely rejected in the 20th century. So socialism and communism were largely rejected in the 20th century. Um, they, they gained prominence towards the latter part of the 20th century, but, but in the beginning, in the 1800s and early 1900s, these were not ideas that were embraced. Capitalism, however, was. Roman numeral four says, responses to the Industrial Revolution, people demanded reforms and better living conditions for all. A. Rise of labor unions. Once legalized, many workers joined and had the power to strike, which was where all workers would stop working at once. This would gain better working conditions from business owners. Through the late 1800s and early 1900s, government passed laws which enforced various reforms. Factories became safer, people worked shorter hours, wages increased with a minimum wage, Millions moved from poor to middle classes. Citizens became safer with police and fire departments and cleaner through public sanitation projects. People lived longer. Child labor was reduced and eliminated. Children provided free public, were provided free public education um, in industrialized nations by the late 1800s. And workers gained more time for leisure activities such as music concerts, radios, movies, bike riding, and sports, such as baseball in America and soccer in Europe. As we move on towards the modern age, I want to talk to you a little bit um, <clears throat> about that. But I'm going to talk to you first about the protest and, re and reformers of the Industrial Revolution. We already talked about the Luddites, um, how they had been um, craftsmen and machines took over their jobs. Um, they organized to try and um, stop industrialization. Um, they saw machines as the cause of unemployment, especially if you were a craftsman or a weaver. Um, and they, they tried to um, stop this. Uh, they tried to destroy the machines that had taken their jobs. Um, but they, they are not successful. Um, then you have the Peterloo Massacre in 1819. This is where British soldiers fire on British workers who were rioting or protesting about working conditions. Uh, socialists, utopians, and Marxists. We just spoke about them. Um, people as a society would operate, operate and own the means of production, not individuals. These were their ideas. Their goal was a society that benefited everyone, not just the rich or well-connected few, and they tried to build perfect communities. The problem with this is people aren't perfect and people are part of communities. So what is the result? Well, by 1850, zones of industrialization on the European continent included Northeast France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Western German states, Northern Italy, and East Germany, or Saxony. So this is a map that shows you where a lot of these industries wound up being. This map shows you how the railroads spread out. All of the red on here are railroad tracks. Um, this is a chart or a graph that shows you um, world manufacturing, how much um, of a share each one of these nations had in world manufacturing. So the politics of industrialization. Um, some nations did begin to um, adopt some socialistic principles. Uh, state ownership of some industries happened in Belgium and most of Germany. That mainly had to do with the railroads. Um, tariffs uh, on, uh, in Britain on corn um, came into effect. Uh, they're called the British Corn Laws. National banks granted a monopoly on issuing uh, banknotes. So the Bank of England, the Bank of France, they were the places that, that were official. Companies were required to register with the government and publish annual budgets. That's some regulation that was put in place. Um, and there was new legislation 
uh, that was put forth to establish limited liability of companies, um, to create rules for forming corporations. Um, those things needed to be dealt with, so it created new laws, new legislation. Um, the postal system was established, um, and free trade was uh, championed by um, Zol Zolverin. Okay. Free trade is where um, there's not any barriers between one nation and another. Um, they'll buy your products, you buy their products, and you don't tax or tariff, uh, put a tariff on each other's. Let's talk a little bit about um, the Industrial Revolution uh, towards the modern age, so 1776 to 1917. Um, this is 5.3 in your guided notes. I'm on Roman numeral one. Scientific and cultural advances in the industrial age. All right, so in biology and medicine, scientists use the microscope to study cells and identify microorganisms, the germ theory of disease. Louis Pasteur, P-A-S-T-E-U-R, developed pasteurization, which is a process to kill bacteria, um, and this led to new antiseptics and vaccines to fight disease. Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species in 1859 and developed the theory of evolution, the idea that all life evolved based on natural selection or survival of the fittest and mutations. In chemistry and physics, scientists discovered all matter of uh, all matter that was made of atoms and developed the periodic table of, uh, of elements. Albert Einstein wrote that time and space are related and energy and matter are interchangeable, and this is called the theory of relativity. That was in 1905. In the areas of art and literature, early 1800s are influenced by romanticism, which emphasized emotion and imagination. Later, they're influenced by realism, which focused on everyday life. People were inspired by the poetry and literature of Lord Byron, Mary Shelley, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and Charles Dickens. The art of, and they were influenced by the art of Pierre Auguste Renoir and Vincent van Gogh, and the music of Ludwig van Beethoven and Rich, Richard Wagner. Roman numeral two is inspired by the American and French revolutions. People in Latin America fought to break from European rule. Toussaint Louverture was a former slave that led a successful slave rebellion on the French-held island of Haiti from 1791 to 1803. Local leaders fought the unfair class system and Spanish rule. Simon Bolivar and Jose de Saint Martin to say San Martin, defeated the Spanish army and created independent states in South America. You should remember that from your study of geography last year. Father Man Miguel Hidalgo proclaimed Mexican independence from Spain on September 16, 1810, and began 11 years of revolutionary struggle. Mexico achieved independence in 1821, but was hurt by many civil wars. Corruption, and controlled by a series of dictators. Mexico lost territory after wars with Texas from 1835 to 1836 and the U.S. from 1846 to 1848 and was invaded and ruled by France from 1862 to 1867. Um, that was actually Napoleon's nephew that was put in place there. This is after Napoleon is long, long gone, but it's his nephew who was put in as the Mexican dictator there. Mexicans were victorious at Puebla on May 5, 1862, but French forces soon seized control. Mexico regained its independence in 1867 under President Benito Juarez. Another Mexican revolution from 1910 to 1920 resulted in democracy with the Constitution of 1917. The new government reduced the power of the Catholic Church and distributed land to the poor. Roman numeral three talks about the growth and development of Great Britain in the Victorian age. By Queen Victoria's rules, uh, 1837 to 1901, Great Britain's government was controlled by the Prime Minister, who was appointed by the political party that controlled Parliament, liberal or conservative. It still works that way in, in uh, the United Kingdom. 
It was an era of reform. Laws were passed to protect workers and extend democracy. Voting rights reforms uh, achieve, were achieved near universal male suffrage, which meant, which meant all men could vote by the year 1885. The suffragists, led by Emmeline Pankhurst, protested for voting rights for women. British women were actually not given full voting rights until 1928. American women got full voting rights before British women did. The British Empire expanded to include Canada, India, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Africa, and Asia, and many islands. Britain's economy and empire was supported by the strongest navy on earth and controlled the world's major trade routes. William Wilberforce, W-I-L-B-E-R-F-O-R-C-E, led Britain to abolish slavery and enforce the end of the slave trade across the Atlantic in 1807. Ireland was part of Britain, but many Irish wanted independence. In 1845, the Irish potato crop failed, which led to the Irish potato famine. Millions starved or fled Ireland. Through the late 1800s and early 1900s, Millions of Irish, German, Italian, Jewish, Polish, Russian, and other Eastern European people immigrated to the U.S. in the hopes of a better life. The next section is the Triumph of Nationalism, 1815 to 1914. This is the nationalism of Napoleon Bonaparte uh, that he initiated throughout Europe. Uh, it actually outlived him quite some time. It set into motion the unification movements of Italy and Germany and began the demise of the Austrian and Ottoman empires. Nationalism created the conditions for intense European rivalries and competition for world war. We're actually going to look at those starting next week. So you only need to have done the guided notes through the... Um, I think it's section 5.3, Toward the Modern Age. You need to have completed 5.3 and 5.4, 5.5. When you get to the triumph of nationalism, stop. We're going to cover that next time. Hopefully this has helped you understand the importance of the Industrial Revolution and some of the innovations that came about at the time, as well as how it ushered in uh, a new time of political upheaval. I will see you next time. Have a good afternoon.